So just before we start, a little moment about who I am. My name is Gemma Zoe Smith. I am a full-time qualified tutor, uh, a qualified si secondary science teacher and uh, an Oxford graduate from uh, three times. So uh, I did my biochemistry degree in Oxford, I then did my master's and then I went back and did my PGCE. Um, typically I travel around the world tutoring students, um, so a couple of the places uh, that I've been, but you know, due to coronavirus I'm currently uh, located in Oxford where I also run the Education Hotel. The Education Hotel helps students to apply to top universities, schools and also supports with GCSEs and uh, A-levels. And we've got about 60 tutors and about 30 mentors and uh, we are very lucky given our location that we've got some really, really standout tutors who are Oxford and Cambridge lecturers as well as head, uh, ex-head teachers, professional tutors and, and top graduates. So that's a little bit about us and um, what we're going to be looking at today, we're going to be looking at learning and revision. So I'm just going to take myself off of the screen and continue talking. So our focus today is in learning and revision. We're going to be looking at the ideal learning spaces, different types of revision, and uh, given that we haven't got all that much time, we're now in February half term, how to revise in a hurry. So those are the three things that I'm going to be focusing on today. So the first things that I want you to think about, and regardless of whether you're watching this on, uh, on catch up or you're watching this live, um, I want you to have a think about what you need to be able to learn. So in which environments do you learn the best? And consider whether you need to be at a desk or do you not need to be at a desk? Do you need to have a specific place within, uh, within your, your house? Or are you okay to move around? Do you work well in a library? Do you work well outside? Think about where it is that you learn the best. Same thing with the time of day and consider where, when, when is it best for you to learn? So are you an early bird? Are you someone who gets up and wants to just get that revision done before the day is out? Or are you somebody who would rather wait until the day is done, you've done everything you want to do in the day, and then you set your revision and you make sure you get it done before you go to sleep? So those are two different types of revision style. Um, are you somebody who likes a checklist? So do you like to be able to tick things off when you are done? So a checklist might be for you. Are you someone who looks at own notes or the textbook and study guide? And this is something given that we're in February half term right now and we're not looking at that much time. If you don't have your own notes, it might be time to consider getting a study guide and actually just adding to that. So if after half term, it's the end of half term right now, you have looked at your notes and you have realized you don't have them, now is the time to, uh, to consider getting those study guides because they are going to speed up your revision significantly. They might not be as detailed as your current own notes. And you might be able to add things to them. You might need to add things to them. But if you are spending you've spent the entire um, half term writing out notes and you still are not there, then uh, it's going to slow you down in terms of revision. Also things to consider, do you learn best with others or are you somebody who learns best on their own? So you will know from, from work that you've done in school or online, uh, whether you learn best with other people or whether you revise best on your own. And consider whether that means with others testing or whether that means actual learning. So it might be that you prefer to do learning on your own, but then you prefer for others to test you and for you to test others to test your knowledge. Or it might be that all of you like to learn together, but then go away and practice questions. So consider those uh, possibilities as well. For length of study session, I'm gonna speak a little bit later about a technique that I like to use, the Pomodoro technique. Um, but consider how long you find that you can concentrate in class before you start to zone out, before you start to really not know what you're doing. And your length of your study session, your revision session should be that length. So for most people, it's somewhere between about 25 minutes and 45 minutes before they start to zone out. Yet, when people think about revision, they often set themselves really long periods to sit down and to really revise. And the problem with that is you get distracted, you procrastinate, uh, you 
go and get yourself a drink. You get on your phone, see Hans on Snapchat. You might um, go and call somebody, or you might just find that you're, you know, you're wandering around your room, doing a bit of tidying up, thinking that you're revising because you're going, oh well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat these things in my head, but really you're not actively revising. So think about how long you want to keep that study session. And then the other one is music. So some people find that they work really well, certain types of music or indeed background noise. So something like rain or something like a, um, uh, a white noise. And other people, it, it has to be silent. And of course, there has to be a certain amount of feasibility in this. So um, if your house is not silent, you might need to look into something like white noise where it fills that gap. Um, but it's about how much of this you can actually do. So in what environments do you learn the best? And so you might say, I need a desk. I want to work at the start of the day and I want to be done by three because that's when I'm normally done by school. Or you might say, well, I'm at school most of the time. So actually my revision is only going to be three to five. Um, I like a checklist. So I'm going to write down what I want to do at the start of the week and then tick it off. And that I like to use a textbook or a study guide. And then if I need to know something, I might go back to my notes. I prefer to learn on my own, but I like to be tested by other people. And my ideal length of study session is around 30 minutes. And I don't like any music. So once you've had a think about that, and if you're watching this on replay, then just give it a pause and have a think. Then I want you to consider how often do you actually achieve that without distractions and without things that you put in the way? So I know that for me, I have to sit at a desk to revise. But really, when I am, um, I recently had to take a, a couple of years ago, I took an exam in order to get a scholarship when I was uh, trained to be a teacher. I didn't revise at a desk. I sat on the sofa because it was much more comfortable. I found I wasn't revising quite as well as I should have been if I was sat at a desk. So I was already, I was already stopping myself from having that ideal learning experience. If I have to sit down and I have to craft an email or I have to write a revision resource for somebody, again, I have to sit at a desk and I have to have it relatively silent. If I put the radio on, I'm not going to get anything done. I know these things, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I stick to them. And so with that in mind, I have written down my ideal study areas. So I know I need a desk. I know that I need it to be quiet. All the things that I know that I need. And then when I start to sit on the sofa or I start to listen to the radio, I have them above my desk so that I can look at them and go, I'm not doing that. And I know that I'm letting myself down. So think about how often you actually achieve what you want to achieve without any distractions and without you sabotaging yourself. Because when we come to GCSEs and we come to A-levels, those exams are, they're yours. And no matter what we've had in terms of uh, disruption to learning or in terms of teacher not being there or not, not being you know, as, as good as you would like, the revision is down to you. So if you are going to put your all into it, and we don't know what's coming up at the moment, we don't know whether there's going to be mini exams, we don't know if there's going to be teacher assessment, internals, mocks, who knows. But it's about giving yourself the best possible opportunity. And that means sticking to the things that you know work for you and not getting swayed by people. So really think about how you can help yourself learn. So some common issues are if you are learning and you really prefer to learn on your own, but your friends have said, let's do a Zoom every Wednesday and we'll all discuss our history essays and, and our key points for history essays. And you think, oh, but I, I work much better by myself. You don't want to miss out, but at the same time, you know you're not going to get as much revision done. So at that point, you're going to have to be honest and say to your friends, it's not the way that I learn. And I, you know, I, I would love for you guys to do it, meet up. That's great. But unfortunately, that's just not the way that I learn. Or you might find that you want to tune in for half of it and say, OK, well, I, I think that probably the best thing for me is for me to come in at the start, 
and and to have a listen to to what everyone's doing and to contribute but i can only do 30 minutes of that and then i'm going to go away and i'm going to consolidate all of that and always put time in to your to your diary to your timetable we'll discuss later for, for seeing friends but at the same time remember that it's up to you so it's up to you to get the grades that you deserve and if you have felt the pressure to learn with friends or you felt like you've had to uh, take time out that you don't necessarily want to take out then that is your decision so make sure that you have those boundaries and, and they're your friends they'll understand they'll understand that that's the way you work and some of them might be feeling the same way as well if your siblings are distracting it really depends on the age of your siblings but again talking to them and saying to them making them understand how important these exams are to you or these mock exams teacher assessments whatever it might be so communicate with them and if your siblings are really young do the same with your parents so if they're continually walking in and out of your room and you're finding it really hard to concentrate do have a chat with your parents and say and make them aware and tell them what is happening often they might not know and ask them if there is a way that you can guarantee that you are going to have some time that you are going to be able to study and that might be that you you know you study outside in a room above the garage or it might mean that on a Saturday morning they uh, they take your siblings for a really long walk and you have the time and you use that time effectively so it's about that communication but it's also about you holding up your end of the bargain if you are a massive procrastinator, and I, I have this, I have technology to the side of me, I have things that, phones that are always ringing, I find it very hard to concentrate. And if I do need to concentrate on something, I will therefore get rid of them all. Get rid of the screens, get rid of everything else, and just focus. So if you are, if you're needing your phone because you need to be contacted or you need it for a calculator, set something called the Forest app, and Forest allows you to um, allows you to block any websites. It stops you from going onto your phone. It, essentially, it grows a tree, and the longer you stay away from your phone, the longer that tree grows for. So that's the general general premise. If you go back to it, that tree does not grow. Um, but other things you can do is set passwords set restrictions to make sure that you are not on social media that you are not on things that distract you that you know are what distract you so you are taking this active active uh, stance against it because you don't want at the end of the day to be blaming yourself um, if you don't come out with the right mock grades or indeed the right mini exam grades or anything that there is an exam for if you have realized during half term that you cannot find anything to start your learning, and this is something that, that I, know, uh, I know has happened with a couple of you, because I know a couple of you who've signed up to these, uh, these sessions or these recordings are my students and you've, uh, you've told me this before. If you can't find anything to start your learning, for a start, this is a big learning point. You, you need to improve your organization. I think you know that. But if you can't find anything to start your learning, you need to organize everything before you go back to school. And that means, unfortunately, spending a day sorting through things. You also probably have lost something. And think about whether it is worth your time finding it or you're just going to redo it. So, again, with the idea of study guides or the idea of flashcards that are pre done, have a think about. Is it worth me spending an hour trying to dig out those physics flashcards that I wrote last year? Or do I just print a whole new, new ones out of the internet, cut them up, start learning them? Because one of those things is more useful for your exams than the other. Mum thinks I should do more, but I do enough learning. And I know that, again, we've got a couple of parents who, uh, who might be watching our replay. Uh, and you might be thinking, this is me. <laughs> I do think that my child should do more. And, and we've had arguments over they think that they do enough learning. And I think that they should do more. Unfortunately, at, at this age, your child is a young adult. And for, for students, you are young adults and you should be taking responsibility for your learning and if you are that is something 
that therefore you should be able to take on. So say that you have set out your timetable and over half term you have worked and you have spent two to three hours every day and you have achieved what you needed to achieve. Perfect. In which case, keep going the way that you're going. But if you haven't set anything out and you've said to mum or dad that, you know, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to do it. And each time they've come into your room, you're not doing it. Then they kind of got a right to be concerned. It's the same as if a boss in a job wanted to see that you were doing something and every time he came past your workstation, you're on Facebook. Again, he'd probably have a bit of a chat with you. He'd probably want to say something. So again, it's about for parents treating our young people as young adults, but also for those young adults, making sure they take on that responsibility. And for some of you, it may be that you would like your parents' involvement. So you would like them to be able to test you on something because that's quite useful. But what you don't want is for them to continually be telling you what you should be doing. Then make sure that a, each person has an understanding of what the other is doing. So if you've got a timetable, share it with them because that's going to help alleviate their worries that you aren't reaching your full potential. So it's all about taking responsibility. If you want to take that responsibility and if you should take that responsibility you are of the age where you should be then do so but provide that evidence just like you would to a boss that you have actually been working so do make sure that, that is an open communication and for parents it is something that at this age we do need to take a slight step back and do let our, our young people work uh, the way that they would like to so if for example they they prefer to work in the evening you feel like they should work in the morning that is something that they are learning how they learn the best so that's the point where we need to step back but if you are concerned that they are not doing enough then make them ask them to give you that evidence what is the evidence that they are doing work and if they can provide that hands off if they can't they might need that little bit of support but remember it's support not nagging okay this is for, for our students who are watching. And this is something that uh, I ask my students to do when you go back to school, whether that's online, whether that's in person, uh, it's called an agreement with yourself. And what it is, is a, a, something that you will, you will write out and you will put next to your ideal learning environment. Like, so again, if you're watching this on, on catch up, do just pause. Um, and this agreement with yourself is something to be written out, something that you know that it's your responsibility. It's all about taking that responsibility. So there's two here that I've used with students before. So I'm going to spend how much time a day once I come home consolidating my notes. So I will work on this between this time and this time each day. And I will use some type of app or some type of timetable to ensure that I achieve this. So again, it is customizable. You might say, I'm going to spend one hour a day when I come home from school revising my French notes. That'd be a lot of em emphasis on French, but maybe you really need to improve on that. I will work on this between 4 and 5 p.m. each day. And I will use Quizlet to ensure that I achieve this. There's another one over to the right. I will ensure that I've added to my revision guides and filed my class notes. So this is somebody who's not that organized uh, by, and I think this was Thursday each week. So this person had a, had a problem with the fact that their notes, they've got to half term and uh, their notes are all over the place. So they've worked this week to, to file them up and to make sure that they've got relative revision guides for any parts that are missing. And we want to make sure that that continues as they're going forward. So they're actually in year 10, not year 11. Um, and so for them, that makes sense to be able to add and, and file. Uh, they're also going to make sure that the homework is done so many days in advance. And again, we're going to use a timetable or planner to ensure that this happens. All right. So moving on to revision styles. There is, used to be, something called VARC. So VARC stood for Visual, Oral, Read, Write, Kinesthetic. And it's something that sometimes people hear about when it comes to revision styles. 
It was coined in the 90s and it was debunked. So the idea was that you would have a predominant learning style. So you would be a visual learner, which means that you learn by pictures and pictures only. You would be a read-write learner, which means that you would only learn by reading things out and writing things down. But it's been debunked, so why am I telling you about it? Well, the, the point of it is that there are lots of learning styles. There is verbal, there is visual, there is oral, there's those types. But really what we're looking for is this one over here, the combination, the purple one. When you revise, you want to be thinking about making your revision as varied as possible. And the reason for that is that you will learn certain things by writing them down, but you will learn different things by making a poem up or drawing and labeling a picture or making a model. And all of these different activities that you are doing to help you to make those connections, those neural connections, which lead us to memory, which is essentially what revision is, it's trying to remember, we need to use a multiple of different things to be able to make those connections. So these are some of different learning styles. So solitary, social, logistical, mathematical, verbal, visual, musical, auditory, physical, kinesthetic, but really we're all aiming for that combination. And what we're saying, when I say a combination, I don't mean necessarily in one revision session. So say, for example, and I'm a biology teacher, so say you were learning the structure of the leaf and photosynthesis. Well, you might learn photosynthesis purely by drawing out the equation, writing out the equation, or you might draw, draw out the structure of the leaf, and that might be a visual picture. So those two things might be written out, and they might be written out multiple times. And then when you come back to test them, and that testing process is really important to ensure that you know your knowledge. When you test, you might find, oh, well, I can mostly remember the photosynthesis equation, but I can't remember what glucose is, C6H12O6. And you might think, well, how am I going to learn that? How am I going to remember that? So if that's the piece of information that you're struggling with, you might then decide, okay, I'm going to put this on a poster. I'm going to put it up somewhere with colors. I'm going to put it right where I brush my teeth. And I'm going to say it before every day when I brush my teeth. So that repetition, that auditory, because you're going to say it out loud, plus, plus a bit of color, and it's going to be there. You're going to kinesthetically kind of link because you know when you brush your teeth, you're going to be talking about glucose. So you're using multiple things. You've done the right part and now you're doing the other parts. Again, with the drawing out the picture of the leaf, you might be able to draw it fine, but you might really struggle to label it. And then what you might do is you might, for yourself, kind of create a, uh, a transparency slide or a, a, a whiteboard. You might get yourself a whiteboard, stick the picture, because you know the picture, down, and then practice on your whiteboard the labeling. So then it's something different. It's not just draw it out and then label it because you know the drawing part. So really you're focusing on the labeling or maybe you get yourself some labels and start putting them in so you know what order they are. Or you might make a rhyme up about it. So you might decide, okay, I'm going to go for cuticle, upper epidermis, then I'm going to go for palisade. Well, that's spelled C-U-P, cup. So cuticle, upper epidermis, palisade. Oh, underneath comes spongy, so cups. And then you might make yourself a, a poem or a rhyme out of that or a monomic to be able to remember. So different ways of learning, but rotate them. Try different things. Don't just think, oh, this is the one thing that I have to stick to. These are my, these are my exact ways of learning. And this, this goes with different types of revision. So often what you see in school is people have loads and loads of flashcards. It's like a massive pile of flashcards, but often they won't work all the way through it. So do think about what you put on your flashcards. They could be used for facts, they can be used for definitions, but they also could be used for questions that you got wrong in a practice paper. So if you got something wrong, you can write the question on the front of the, back, front of the um, flashcard, you can write the ideal answer on the back, and that allows you to be able to go through that question that you often got wrong. 
you might see that people have a lot of mind maps and mind maps can be really great for things like history essays or English essays and you can write the theme in the middle and you can write all of the different quotes that you might need and all of the different authors that you might need coming off. But again, unless you can recreate those mind maps, it might not work great visually, or it might not work great in making those connections, those neural connections in your mind that are so important for revision. So if you've planned out a mind map, it looks really great, but it's kept in a book somewhere and it's not out, you can't read it. And you think, oh, I'll, I'll read through it once or twice. And then you come to do a practice question. So you are doing that practice question. And you think, I know I've got a mind map, I can't remember where it is then you probably need to move it out of that book and you probably want to put it on a wall somewhere or you might want to do it in a whole new different way so you might take that mind map and you might record yourself saying it so you might say oh for the theme of love these are the poems that I would choose and within each of these poems I'd look at this literary technique or this poem is done by this person and you might record yourself saying those notes saying that mind map listen to it every time you're going somewhere every time you're on your daily walk listen to that that mind map or those spoken out mind maps and again they're a different way to learn so try and use different types of revision the ones at the bottom the practice questions time mocks powerpoints memory palace i want to spend a little bit more time on i talk a lot about practice questions practice essays essay plans timed mock exams and the reason that i mention those so much is that those are the ways that you will find out if you know what you think you know and this comes from a personal story of mine uh, when i was in year 10 i did i did some mocks when i was in year 10 and i sat the first one i did was was a math mock and i remember going into the exam and thinking it's great i know everything i've learned it and then I sat down and I opened the paper and it seemed as though that paper was written of everything that I hadn't revised. And I panicked, I had a really bad panic and I actually left the room. Um, I completely, completely just had to leave. And I, I came out and I, I was a, a fairly confident math student and I came out with a C and it wasn't my best work and I knew it wasn't and it just it just felt really horrible to me it suddenly was like everything is stacked against me i feel like they've just tried to ask me all the questions that they knew that i wouldn't like and then i realized that actually what had happened is i thought i knew those topics before i went in i thought that those topics were the ones that that i'd covered you know i'd cover those ages ago of course i know what that is and actually i hadn't I hadn't revised them. Of course, I know what industry rules are. I did those back in year eight. Yeah, but I've not looked at those for two years and therefore I've forgotten them. Had I done more practice, had I done more timed exams, I would have realized that earlier. And as it was, luckily, it was a mock exam and it was something that, uh, I mean, for, for GCSEs, I came up with 10A stars. So it, it made little, little sense afterwards. And the reason for that was. After I hit that, that mock exam and I came out and I felt that way, I decided that I'd needed to pick up my revision style. And what I'd been doing is I'd been doing a lot of passive reading, reading through notes and going, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, of course I remember that. I hadn't been doing a lot of active, re active revision. And with active revision, it's where you're testing yourself and where you are writing things like practice es essays or essay plans. If you don't have time to write the essay, write the plan. That will tell you whether you know what you're talking about. Um, I hadn't been doing flashcards or testing myself. I'd just been reading. That's all I'd been doing. Just sitting there looking at the book, going, yeah, I'm pretty sure I know this. I hadn't been testing myself. So that is why I put them so prominently in a revision uh, schedule. There is no point writing flashcards if you never test yourself on them. There is no point, um, there's no point going through a textbook if you're not testing yourself you need to do that testing that's the only way that you're going to find out that you don't know what you thought you knew memory palace now memory palace has been popularized by sherlock holmes um but it was used before that it was used um by card counters for example 
in uh, and people who who look at memory techniques and and the idea of a mind palace is that you go round your house or you go round a walk that you know or you go round somewhere somewhere that's really familiar with you and you if you struggle to remember something you make it big you make it imaginative so say you are struggling with a, a physics equation so a physics equation which would be something like force equals mass times acceleration so for me f equals ma i have to put a lot of force in to move a lot of mass and to accelerate it a lot so maybe i put it near the front door and i in my head imagine a giant elephant on a skateboard and that's quite a big image i'm going to remember that giant elephant on the skateboard sitting on my front step and i have to think about the amount of force i'm going to need to use to push that elephant away and to make him accelerate on that skateboard. So I now know that there's a force and there's an acceleration there. And that elephant is massive. So I know that force equals mass times acceleration. Now, I don't need to put an elephant on my front step to be able to imagine it. What I might do is I might write F equals MA on a little post-it and put it near my front door. Or I might draw a little picture of an elephant and put it near my front door. But every time I go past my front door, I am going to imagine that giant elephant sitting there on that tiny little skateboard. And me pushing that elephant is massive, so I've got to push him really hard with a lot of force. Force equals mass times acceleration. So that memory palace, that's one way that it is used. You can combine it with recording yourself. So you can go around your house and record what you need to remember, and then you can walk around with your recording and you can pause it and you can say what the next thing is until you have learned it. And it's a, it's a really useful way because it uses movement. So some kinesthetic stuff in there. It uses some big imagination, which again is really great for neural pathways. Big images. Don't, don't make them small or boring. You need to make them massive. And it uses something that's verbal as well as something that's visual. So you're looking at all of these different ways of learning and you're combining them all in a memory palace. And the same thing can be done with a PowerPoint. So if you are, um, you're struggling with, say, something like geography, case studies in geography, they're quite long. They've got quite a lot of detail in them. And they can sometimes be quite hard to, uh, to, to remember all that detail. So the easiest way to do so is to, you can put it in a PowerPoint, but don't just put it in a PowerPoint and write it down. Put it in a PowerPoint and try teaching someone else. Try teaching someone who never learned about it and get them to ask questions as they go along. Or imagine presenting it and record yourself doing it and then watch it back. It's really embarrassing, but it is something that you will notice. Wait a minute. I never realized that there was this connection between the uh, tsunami in Japan and the, the I never realized that there was this number of numbers in it or something. You, know, you, can, you will usually pick up things as you record and play that PowerPoint back. So it's another great way of mixing different learning styles. Now, the biggest thing about revision is starting early. And possibly you are here because you, you are struggling with revision. You might not be. I ask some of my students to, to watch this video back. So um, if you are struggling with revision, then it is all about repetition. You see here the repetition in the graph. So you might have looked through the majority of your notes over half term, and that might have been a couple of days. If you now leave it until your mocks or until your internal exams or until the next time you have to look at it, you're going to forget over 60% of it very, very quickly. You see this blue projected forgetting curve. By the time you get to 10 days after you've learned it, you're looking at 55% of what you've learned remembered. And you've put all that work in in half term, and now you can only remember half of it. Whereas if sometime next week you spend 10 minutes recapping, and it doesn't need to be long, it just needs to be going through and going, okay, I remember this, okay, I remember this. Yep, I, ugh, I can't really remember this part of it and focusing on that part and changing what you do or doing some questions. That will be as good as a first reminder. But you have to do it regularly. If you leave it and you keep leaving it, you're not going to remember it. If you go back to it, 
something like Quizlet is great for this because you can go back, you can do something very quickly. It doesn't need to take that long, but then you can boost that memory back up. You can boost those neural pathways and they'll reconnect and it will make sense. You will end up with that reminder forming better revision. So make sure if you have just gone through everything in half term, then boost that by doing it again next weekend or reading through it or going through your notes or getting someone to test you on flashcards or doing a paper, something to help you remember. And ideally, what you want to be looking at is doing that after school every day, little and often, even if it is 10 minutes of a subject and those 10 minutes of a subject just happen to be random questions. That is better than leaving it. If you do not have that much time, then little and often. So after school, every day, I'm going to do 10 minutes of math questions. And you're going to go on to Corbett Math and you're just going to pick a random revision shape. And you're just going to do it. And it's going to take you 10 minutes and that's it. And that's as much as you can do, then that's what you do. If you can do 30 minutes over the week of every subject, then 30 minutes each week, you're actually spending quite a lot of time doing each of those subjects. So that might mean doing some bits on the weekend, but at the point now, we're at half term February, you haven't got that long if you set school or set internal mocks or school or set internal exams. Don't spend all your time on one exam. History is a really big one for this. People spend all their time on history and days and days on history. And then they realize that there are other subjects and they think they know them like I did with my math. I thought I knew it, but actually what that means is they've just read through it. So do try and do little and often and, and also active revision. Okay, intensive revision. And this might be, some of this was relevant for, for last week when you were looking at half term, but it's also if you're spending your weekends and you're thinking, I really want to push my grade up, my chemistry grade, I want to boost that from a six to a seven. I'm going to need to really focus on it. This is about motivation and how to stay, stay motivated for several hours. So as I mentioned, this is, this is the Pomodoro technique. I use a kind of a, a adapted version of it, but it all starts with deciding what task you want to complete. So you set yourself a task. You set yourself, I am going to spend 25 minutes learning about the Weimar Republic in history. And I need to know uh, all these facts, but I currently can't remember most of them. You set your timer, 25 minutes, and you work using a variety of revision techniques until that timer rings. And then you take a short break and then you repeat. Now it says repeat four times. I actually personally only use three times and then take a longer break. So the first might be Weimar Republic in history. The second one might be that I'm looking at moles in chemistry. And the third one might be that I am looking at a specific poem in my power and conflicts um, booklet and I'm doing the analysis on that. And then the other thing that I've added in with my students is once we've done those, those 25 minutes short stuff, we'll then go back to it once you've taken that longer break. So once we've taken that longer break, we'll then do a question on each, just to make sure that you remember it and you haven't forgotten it all in the break. So repetition, again, is just the same as that one up here, talking about repeating. So little and often, little and often, even when you're looking at intensive. Timetables. People love them, people hate them. And, uh, and it, it's, it's, all about, it's all about working to what you think is best. So if looking at this timetable makes you break out in a cold sweat, then do it a different way. Get yourself everything that you need to do in the week, write it on bits of paper, fold it up and put it into a jam jar, pick one out, set yourself that timer and work on it. That way you've got a bit of, un you've got a bit of uncertainty. So you might pick out an essay plan or you might pick out 25 minutes of math questions. Who knows? If that is something that you don't want to do, again, pop yourself a checklist down. I want to achieve these three things by the end of the day. And I'm going to spend 25 minutes on each of them and set that timer for 25 minutes and then pick one of them. It doesn't need to be written out 
in this type of timetable if this timetable keeps you on track and i know for some of my students it does and it means that then you can tick it off and you can go i've done this and i've done this and i've done this then write it out but don't forget to timetable your time off so those unscheduled breaks because they are important and they are as important as learning time because you need to be able to have some scheduled downtime not just oh i finished early so therefore i'm going to uh, i'm, I'm going to call a friend really scheduled time off that might be time off to do some baking that might be time off to watch a film but it needs to be actual scheduled time off consider your goals it's one of the final things that i need to say short term they may well be to pass an exam but think about what they mean long term to you does it mean that you are going to be able to go to university or move to college to be able to do that hairdressing course that you've wanted to do diploma course does it mean that you are then happy with the fact that you've got these grades does it mean that eventually sometime down the line you will be able to get the job that you want consider what your long-term goals are your long-term goals to travel is there something which maybe learning this language is really important to you so that you can do that traveling consider time related versus task related goals so i've been talking a lot about spending 25 minutes doing something doing a task so they are both time related and task related but if you are saying if you're struggling to to get the task done in a certain amount of time so again i'll go back to history because it tends to take a long time you're struggling to learn all the dates of suffrage because by the time you start it takes you three hours to get through your notes then you need to put a time related goal on that that means that you're going to spend two hours and then you are going to stop you need to put that time related goal in there and a time related reward with it as well so you're going to spend two hours split into maybe shorter time zones and then once it's done you're going to reward yourself and the same thing with your revision schedules if you have said that you're going to spend a certain amount of time on a saturday you're going to get up like you have this morning to to do that revision and then you are you're going to have the rest of the day off well then plan something so that you're looking forward to it because otherwise what you would end up with is you will just keep keep going because you've got nothing to look forward to so make sure that those rewards are related to your goals okay we've got a couple of moments left so what i thought we'd do is have a look at some commonly asked questions the first one is well, where can i go to find some great revision resources so this is something that i get asked quite a bit um, and something that uh, we we put over on the education hotels facebook page um, so if you're looking for something like great resources for math uh, the immediate ones that come to mind are math genie um, white rose white rose math um, and corbett so those are kind of the top ones i think on there sciences i'd always use something like save my exams or physics and math tutor those are the the ones that i automatically go for now the reason that i go for those is that they are question sites so those are where i'm usually looking to test knowledge Again, it's all about that active revision something like a, a geography where you've got all those case studies then you might be looking for for using one of the revision study guides that have been produced by the exam board because because they have your case studies in them or somewhere like z notes they have great case studies as well so always ask first of all the teacher because they should have some ideas friends because they will be using something and then do look at whether you are going to use something like a cgp book or indeed one done by the syllabus and i would always try and use a revision guide that has been produced by the exam board or endorsed by the exam board because ultimately they are then writing the types of questions in there and the types of example essays in there that they would expect to see so always try and go for something that is done by the syllabus how can i use exam questions well, i've talked quite a lot about that but um but one of the the best ways to do so is is not don't just do the 
do the exam, mark it and go, oh, I got 62%. Uh, you want to take all of those questions that you didn't understand. There'll be some that will be silly mistakes, but the ones that you didn't understand and put them in a book. And then that book becomes your learning book. Because let's face it, most of the stuff, hopefully, you'll remember. And most of the stuff you would have understood. And actually, by really targeting those areas where you are not so certain, you've created your own question bank. And it's your own question bank that you know that you got it wrong the first time. So use those question exam questions. If it's an essay-based subject, so it's such as English, and you've written the essay, you're not certain what other people would have done, look it up or get hold of friends. So that's where doing those questions separately, but coming together, that will definitely help. And that's something that your school should have been doing is pulling together all of your answers and then they should be redistributing them. If they're not, you want to be doing that and you want to be asking your English teacher if they have those example essays, because you should be able to read through someone else's English essay. Go, wow, I didn't realize that point was important or I didn't realize that point existed. And that's a way to increase your essay knowledge. You might look down their essay and go, well, I probably think mine's maybe slightly better. And then you can think about how you would improve theirs. So that helps you to be able to work out where your answer sits in relation to everybody else. So use those exam questions, but don't just do them. Make sure they're marked. Make sure they're used beyond just that. I got this grade. Because there's no point knowing that you got this grade in a mock exam if you don't then do something about it. So for me, when I got that C, I came back, I wrote out all the questions that I knew that I should have known in a book. That became my, the start to my math book. And actually, by the time we reached year 11, people were coming up to me and asking me how I'd managed to do it. Because I carried this book around with me. And every time I got something wrong, I would write it down in the book. And they started to realize, wait a minute, she, you know, now she's taking these exams and previously she was getting around 50% and now she's getting around 80%. And people started to come up and ask, well, how are you doing this? And, and I, I said to them, all I'm doing is when I get a question wrong, I'm writing the right answer down and I'm not getting rid of the, the paper. And I showed them, I said, this is the book. This is the book that I've got that is all the questions that I've got wrong since year 10. Um, and, and again, even if you're looking at just doing this now, this is when the majority of the questioning starts, it's February time anyway, but you, you, can, you can come up with a sheet of paper, which happens to be all the questions that you're wrong. It doesn't matter how big it is, because it's all about those your incorrect questions. So if they're your incorrect questions, and you know that you started out with loads of them, but actually now you've learned what they mean and how to do them, and the ideal answers, it's just improving your exam technique, it's improving your knowledge as well. So do try and use them as a learning point. And then the last one, what if I don't have notes or flashcards? So again, if you've discovered that during the half term, you don't have those revision materials that you thought you had made or that you've lost or that they are, they're somewhere and you've moved, or you know you thought they were online but they're not online then now is the time to really think about revision guides or to think about pre pre-written flashcards to think about things that other people have created and adapt them they don't have to be printed and people always say someone else's notes aren't as good as yours and that's true but someone else's notes can be read through and can be altered by you so if you have a friend who is really good at keeping notes and you weren't so great and they are happy for you to use their notes, then they might send through those images, but you might then go and add things to them. So you might have remembered something different. You might have remembered it a different way. You might go through and you might highlight them. And suddenly they start to become your notes, little doodles, little images, things to try and help you memorize. And you might then turn those notes into a Quizlet. And that then, they're not your notes anymore, really. You've created this Quizlet. You've created this active revision that you're going to do once a week. You're going to answer this Quizlet and it's a better way of learning. So don't just keep them as their notes or as the, the revision textbook or the, the study guide flashcards. Adapt them. Adapt them so that they suit you.